Hey folks, before we get started with episode 5, I just wanted to come to you after I recorded real quick. The audio sounds a little weird. I'm trying to figure out what's going on with that, but uh, understand that I realize it's a little different. I'm trying to get all that figured out. Bear with me on that, but I hope you enjoy this episode. Howdy everybody and welcome back to the Kentuckian. We're going to be talking about the Second Amendment of the Constitution of the United States of America. We'll cover the true nature of the Second Amendment what it means for us and why it is arguably the most important amendment in the Bill of Rights and the most important legislation in all of Western civilization, arguably, anyway. So let's go ahead and jump into it. I hope this is going to be an exciting episode for you and something that I think is very important to cover. So let's start off by just reading the Second Amendment. A well-regulated militia, being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Overall, it's a pretty straightforward amendment. The opening phrase speaks to the necessity of a militia to keep a free state secure. And I want to talk about this for a while because the militia is an important part of the Second Amendment and something that people don't really understand and also tend to use as a bit of a uh, excuse to like disregard the second half of the Second Amendment. So let's just talk about it a little bit. What something or something that many of us may not realize is that militias have been a vital part of national defense both in this country and throughout the world for a very very long time while most countries have maintained some sort of professional army most of the time they were generally quite small because outfitting training and maintaining a large standing army is very expensive militias did most of the fighting and protecting of the frontier for much of the early history of america including the entire time of the colonies Even with the relatively massive army and navy maintained by the British Empire, they could not afford to use most of those troops on colonial defense, and they usually raised armies from locals and or used local militias for colonial defense for that purpose. Even by the time of the war between the states, the United States Army was only a a few thousand soldiers strong, and additionally, to add to that, the United States Army was in some ways smaller than other countries, um, at least compared to population and everything, but that was by design. And this is where we start getting into like what a militia really is, why it's important, and the role that it plays both in the Second Amendment and in American politics and the way that our country is supposed to be run. See, the Founding Fathers were by and large opposed to a standing army, either completely most of the time, or maybe they they might be okay with a very small standing army, but generally they were completely opposed to uh, the federal government having a standing army at all. Militias were meant to be the cornerstone of national defense, and their logic was basically this. The federal government can't tyrannize people if it has no army to do it with. See, tyranny, the application of force to coerce a people in an innately wrong way is impossible without some way to apply said force. That makes sense, I think, right? You think about a bully, right? He can't bully somebody if he doesn't have muscles, right? Seems kind of weird, but that's exactly the the same idea, right? If you don't have any way to apply force, you can't force someone to do something you don't want to. They don't want to do. Some will argue the National Guard is the modern incarnation of the local militia. Um, that's pretty far from the truth. The militia is basically a military unit over which the federal government has no control. That is a Oversimplification, understand that. There's a lot of nuance. There's generally some sort of legislation in state governments addressing their local militias, and generally state governments um, hold some sort of control over state militias, or at least they should. The militia is, though, in essence, a volunteer army for an individual state. Again, I am oversimplifying the idea of a militia, but it's not an overly complicated idea in one sense either. But the National Guard just doesn't really fit into that that area. The National Guard is basically an extension of the U.S. Army, um, basically reserves. It, it just doesn't really fall into the definition of what a militia has traditionally been and what it was thought of as by the founding fathers. See, Congress is authorized to equip and train militias. Um, I forget which article of it. I've read it more than once in the Constitution. Uh, but the Constitution is clear that they have no control over militias. So one of the things that Congress is explicitly authorized to do is equip and train militias, but it is extremely clear that the only time the federal government can 
in any way tell the militias what to do is when they're actually called up, say, for a time of war, right? We're being invaded. We need defense, so we call up the militia. That's the only time Congress ever has any influence over the actual actions of the militia. All they can do is make sure that they're well-armed and well-trained if they want to. The Constitution doesn't indicate that the Congress has to, but they have the authorization to if they feel that it's necessary. The militias also served a secondary purpose. They would serve as a check to the federal government. Were it to ever raise an army of its own and tyrannize its people or something of that nature, they would have other armies in that area to contend with, right? They couldn't just walk all over people. Uh, instead of having an ill-armed, ill-trained civilian populace, there would be militias. There would be organized, armed people, a, a military unit that's ready to stand against a tyrannical government. Thomas Jefferson said, none but an armed nation can dispense with a standing army. The militia as envisioned in the Constitution was basically just well-armed people. Again, there's more nuance to that, but from a federal standpoint, that's basically all it is. That they're just, people are armed, and they can arm them more, they can make sure they're trained, but that's it. State law kind of starts to come in there. It's interesting how different states have dealt with that at the time. One thing people may not realize is, the time of the war between the states, uh, most of the militaries on both sides were were made from militias. Some militias that already existed, um, although many of them were formed in response to many of the issues of the day, um, but also militias that were formed basically when everything really started to go haywire, when the war really started to kick off, people were organizing into militias and, and volunteer companies and then going and, and joining the Confederate or the Union Army especially the Confederate Army. Most of the Confederate Army was um, composed of militias, especially early on, and then they were just sort of mustered into the Confederate Army. And then, in fact, Ab uh, not Abraham Lincoln, excuse me, um, Robert E. Lee, when he first accepted command after he refused command of the Union Army that was offered to him by the Secretary of War um, for Abraham Lincoln, in order to put down the insurrection in the cotton states, uh, <laughs> as they put it, when he refused that, he took command not of the of some Confederate army, he took command of Virginia's citizen army. He took command of Virginia's militias. I believe that was before they had act I think they had seceded, but I don't believe they had actually joined the Confederacy yet. And so they were organizing their own militias to get ready to defend against a tyrannical Union government that was preparing by calling up tens of thousands of troops to invade and tyrannize the South. So that's kind of the idea of a militia, right? It, it's a relatively independent military organization that's composed of regular people. Um, some of the founding fathers talked about militias need to, to be self-equipped in some ways. Um, or that would help with the general idea of, of what a militia should be. And they kind of kill two birds with one stone by saying not only is this a cornerstone of national defense, so we don't need a standing army. It also serves as a check if there is a standing army that for some reason has been formed by the government. To stop tyranny. The Second Amendment was not for hunting. Hunting was an important part of just living at that time. I don't I doubt they even thought about it, quite frankly. It's explicitly about defending against tyranny. That's what the possession of arms is about. And along with that, the second half of the Second Amendment, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, comes into play. Militias are supposed to exist. That's covered in the first part, right? That they're necessary for the security of a free state. And to that end, the general populace is to be well-armed to the point that the federal government shall not infringe upon the right of your average citizen to keep and bear arms of any kind in any way. It is a totally exclusive statement. Shall not be infringed. Period. It's not complicated, but we tend to make it complicated today. And we'll jump into that in just a second. So that's really the gets to, I think, the core of the Second Amendment, what it really means, what it's really about. It's about militias. It's about people being able to bear arms. Your average person, apart from the militia, being able to bear arms. That's why the, you have that those two phrases. As short as it is, it does address two separate things. <clears throat> 
And to the end that people are well armed, to the end that a standing army would not be needed, to the end that a standing army could be stood against by an, an organized military force, regular people are allowed to have arms with no restrictions, period. That's all there is to it. Again, hunting it doesn't have anything to do with it. We'll talk a little bit about the idea of where modern weapons come into this, but before we get to that, I will mention since we're on it, because um, people will make the point about, well, that was for muskets, right? And they didn't know what kind of what kind of weapons we'd get today. And first of all, it's pretty dumb, or not dumb, it's pretty, I don't know, short-sighted to assume that the founding fathers just thought that technology would stay stagnant forever and that we would always have muskets and cannons. You, you're not giving them much credit to, to try and say that, but at the same time, um, there were already innovations toward and, and innovations that the, that the founding fathers were by and large in huge support of that were going towards automatic fire. I mean, you had early Gatling guns that had been designed 20, 30, 40 years before the puckle gun. You can go Google it. It's kind of funny looking, but it's basically a simple Gatling gun, and they liked it, and they wanted those. Um, it's not like they. It's not like that sort of technology wasn't already being thought about. People owned cannon at the time. Granted, maybe not many people. Um, there's one story from uh, I believe it's before the revolution. There was a newspaper that was getting mobbed for some reason. I don't remember all the details. I want to look it up sometime. But the guy had, it was a publishing office newspaper, and the guy had a little cannon in his office. And when they tried to like come in to destroy his, his press, he actually had this cannon set up in the doorway. Now they still ended up, I think, destroying the press and everything. But it was just kind of this sort of interesting um, um, story where, yeah, people had that sort of stuff. And it's kind of funny because in so many ways, so many things are connected. That sort of goes to, to the importance of understanding history, right? The very first episode I did, I talked about why it's important to understand it. And even the episode on the war between the states, I mentioned that a lot of times policies and political action is being made or suggested or pushed for based off of a misunderstanding or a lack of understanding of history. And trying to claim that, well, the technology's changed so that the Constitution no longer applies is one of those tactics. You have to understand the time and, and that they knew what they were talking about. The point was to have people that could hold their own against the military. And to hold their own against the military, it's best if they have military-grade weapons. And you basically, and we're about to get into that, basically can't have those today. So as we think about the Second Amendment, what it really means and sort of how it's been dealt with, what does that mean for us today? How does that affect us today? As those of you that are familiar with the gun industry know, uh, there are many areas in which arms, right, the idea of, of guns and firearms and, and weapons in general, are quite restricted. And there's something a lot of people that are outside the industry don't realize. If you, if you don't do anything with guns, there's a lot that people just don't know and they kind of assume things and a lot of times end up being wrong. And uh, hopefully, I think maybe this will this will help shed some light on that. While you can technically own just about any weapon, most classes of weapons, if you want to think of it that way, have so many restrictions and fees and taxes. And this includes firearm accessories. I mean, you're talking about firearms, classes of firearms, firearm accessories, explosives, explosive-based weapons that owning most of these things are basically totally impractical. They're basically impossible for most people. Technically, if you have a lot of money and you're able to pass all the background checks and everything, you could own some of these. One of the easier to own of this, you, you can't technically just go and buy a machine gun, a fully automatic weapon of any kind, unless you have a Class Three federal firearms license, which, by the way, is both difficult to get and expensive to maintain. Um, also, another example, you need a special license to own suppressors and not silencers. Silencers aren't, that's a whole different issue, but suppressors. Um, there are barrel regula length regulations for long guns like rifles and shotguns. Uh, I don't know if I really have time. I don't think I do. There's one example of weird regulations having to do with sawed off shotguns, um, but I won't get into that right now. Maybe, uh, maybe another episode, I'll bring it up sometime. 
Um, so there's all these weird regulations, and those are some of the easier to get, right? Like you can can get a class three federal firearms license. It's not easy. It's it's a difficult process, a long process, and and it is kind of expensive. But you can get it. You could own a, a fully automatic rifle, a, a machine gun of some kind. But it's very restricted, very restricted. Also, if you're going to sell guns as a business, you have to have a special license to sell them. Uh, and these are all federal regulations. However, as we've already seen, the Second Amendment is quite clear that the federal government has no authority to infringe upon the right to keep and bear arms in any way. That's what it says, right? The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Both of those phrases in the Second Amendment are connected, but they also, to some degree, function on their own, right? The first phrase gives a bit of a setup for why the second phrase exists, right? So the people should be able to keep and bear arms without any infringement from the federal government. And, I mean, I think you all can see this is pretty obviously a restriction by the federal government. No federal gun control uh, had ever been implemented, however, until the Gun Control Act of 1934. The biggest feature of this was being the banning of the possession of machine guns and submachine guns. And in case you don't know, uh, submachine guns are just automatic weapons that use a pistol cartridge. Um, in a claimed attempt to stop organized crime, gangsters in places like Chicago, you got Al Capone and all that, right? Those were real people. Um, but it was basically, they said it was to stop gun violence, right? In essence, that's a bit of a simplification. It's like, oh, there's this organized crime, so let's, let's make machine guns illegal, and this will help with that. Of course, as you might not be surprised to know it really didn't do anything except stomp on the rights of law-abiding American citizens and started to strip the teeth out of local militias, right? Because machine guns were basically a common military weapon at the time and started to really come into, into just use with every modern military across the world that could get them. And so now your average person and my extension, your militias, couldn't really own machine guns. It's interesting, though, that FDR was extremely liberal, liberal and a tyrannical president. It's not really a surprise that he would have pushed for legislation like this, right? He did a lot of messed up stuff. It would actually be great to study him in more detail at some point. As we think about this idea of, of gun control and how it's gotten worse and worse throughout the years, the first being relatively mild and then just getting worse and worse and worse. And now it's an extremely complicated and difficult process for most guns, aside from your basic long guns and pistols, uh, from a federal standpoint anyway. As we do think about this, I want to give you a quote from George Mason. Now, you may not have heard of George Mason. He was the first president of the United States under the Articles of Confederation. George Washington was the first president under the Constitution. So he said this, 40 years ago, when the resolution of enslaving America was formed in Great Britain, the British Parliament was advised by an artful man who was governor of Pennsylvania to people that it was the best and most effectual way to enslave them, but that they should not do it openly, but weaken them and let them sink gradually by totally disusing and neglecting the militia. See, this was something they understood back then, and that was used back then to try and tyrannize the American colonies, eventually leading to the formation of the United States. See, the undermining of the militia is the most important step, maybe not the first step, maybe not the most obvious step, but the most important step in total disarmament and complete tyranny of the American people. Now, think about it. Not only is the militia frowned upon in many circles, it is completely and totally ne neglected by state governments as well. Two other things I want to briefly address before we move on. One is like the idea of heavy weapons or, or modern weapons, right, because technology has advanced quite a bit. People will make various points about what people should, quote unquote, be allowed to have. This and related issues, I think, probably warrants a separate discussion. But the point with the Second Amendment is for the people to have arms comparable with that of any modern military, whether that's muskets or machine guns, whether it's cannon or tanks. People make a point about, well, then are people allowed to own nukes, right? They go to the absolute extreme. And while the nuances of nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction are too much to get into here, I just don't have the time. Suffice it to say that while I personally think that no government, person, or entity should have access to weapons of that magnitude, uh, they are both totally impractical for an individual or small groups to obtain or manufacture, uh, just from a scientific standpoint. And I believe that most of them, uh, nuclear weapons in particular, are becoming mostly obsolete. 
I don't think that they will be much of a threat for very much longer, personally, if technology keeps advancing the way it has been. Again, there's so much more we could go into with that, but we just don't have time right now. But any other weapons, fair game. And while it may not be practical for your average Joe to own a fighter jet, at least some militias would optimally be managed by a good state government, right? Remember back the war between the states. I mean, they were they were they had militias. They were an important part of defense, and that would relieve some of the the weight of the cost of modern military arms. There's some other stuff I would love to talk about. I just don't have time. I need to move on. One more issue is that of background checks. If we were to go into a store and buy a gun, they would have to run a background check to see if 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 you're mentally ill or if you're a felon. You can't buy a gun if you're either. That on the surface seems to be another infringement, something that I've thought about and some people will, will try and make points about or try and use a gotcha like, well, you're OK with background checks or what? You you want lunatics to get guns? so You want to take away background checks? Um, while I don't really in principle think it's an infringement, it, it's simply ensuring that those who are either through actions of their own or through disabilities outside their control are not qualified to bear arms as a free and responsible citizen. In principle, I don't think there's an issue with it. That being said, considering the kind of government we have and the lack of regulation on private transactions, which I wholeheartedly support, by the way, the actual utility of this system, I believe, is questionable at best. And I believe there are other, quote unquote, safer alternatives to keeping arms out of the hands of the few that do not qualify to possess them. Again, more we could talk about there. Don't have time. So finally, I briefly want to consider the Second Amendment as the most important amendment to the Constitution. This isn't a conclusion, we'll get to that in a minute, but it does sort of start to, to tie everything together. We've already discussed certain elements of the importance of the Second Amendment, how disarming people is the best way to tyrannize them, that a standing army should not be trusted, that a militia provides a viable defensive alternative, et cetera, et cetera. We've talked about all that. But at its core, I think one of the, the key principles of the, Second Amendment, of the Second Amendment is that it's the most grounded check against tyranny. The First Amendment holds the invaluable position of guaranteeing the free exchange of ideas, freedom of religion, and peaceful assembly for the redress of grievances. All peaceful avenues should be pursued fully and will hopefully keep a government from ever becoming tyrannical in the first place. But at the end of the day, they're just words. And on a practical level, due to the degradation of our governmental system and various other factors throughout the years, there comes a time at which words, protests, and votes mean nothing. Yeah, that, that we, we, we might be at that point or getting to that point. They had elections in the Soviet Union. That doesn't mean they meant anything. But an armed and prepared populace is a physical barrier to tyranny. It's tangible. That's the whole point of slowly destroying the militia and our gun rights without the total door-to-door -door disarmament, right? That's why it's a gradual process. So that's why... They don't just come out and say, yeah, we're going to take all your guns, and they start just marching door to door and loading them up into a truck and destroying them. Because the government knows it could never get away with it. That's why it's so important, and that's why they use the gradual tools, right? Because they can't be so open about it, because you have a tangible defense against tyranny in your firearm. And the idea that some people say that, oh, the government outguns us, there's no way we could ever fight back, is total hogwash. All right. First of all, it should bother us greatly that the military does outgun us so much. Right. It shouldn't be an excuse to, to not do your duty as an American citizen. But also, most of the wars we've been involved in and lost many men to in the last 60 years were insurgencies by ill equipped but devoted fighters. For example, think about Vietnam and most of the desert wars, if you want to phrase it that way, that we've had in the last couple of decades. It's been mostly ill equipped insurgents that we've been fighting and not winning against or not not making much progress against the idea that just because the United States military is technologically superior somehow makes the second amendment obsolete is just, it's, it's just hogwash. All right. And again, we could talk about that more in detail in a different episode, but I don't have time right now. The second amendment though, as we bring it back around is the ultimate defense against tyranny, the ultimate tangible defense against tyranny and should be protected with everything we have. I mean, that's what ticked off our own war for independence. The colonists tried peaceful solutions until the British government attempted to disarm the people. Until they tried to disarm the militias and everything got kicked off with a shot heard around the world on Lexington Green. 
we have to understand how vital this is, folks. It is so vital that we as Americans truly understand what the Second Amendment really means. It emphasizes a federally independent militia and that to such end, your average person should be well armed and unmolested by federal regulations. When you think about what it means with how militias are viewed and who, somebody's making that decision, who might be trying to undermine this most foundational element of freedom. There's always much more that could be covered, uh, maybe another time. But for now, if you like what I do and want to work together to make a difference, please share this podcast, tell your friends, and of course, listen to my other episodes. Your all support does mean so much to me. I know I say it a lot, and I'm going to keep saying it because it really does. And you all do make a difference by, by, by helping out, by listening, doing whatever you can. If you'd like to support me in a more personal way, you can contribute directly to me on Anchor or visit my Patreon that's linked in the description below. The first of the weekly news recap should be coming out today as well, so be on the lookout for that. We'll see how that goes. Hopefully that'll be an interesting and productive episode. If you have any comments, questions, topics, or anything else that you'd like me to cover, please feel free to reach out to me. And as I leave you for this episode, always remember, as long as you and I are doing the right thing, we can make a real difference in this world.